Okay, hello everybody. Um, let's, let's just get started. It's, it's the last talk of the day. Uh, we've been through amazing talk. I have so many people to mention during my talk because uh, a lot of speakers touch so many parts um, that are really, really part of, of the story that I'm going to tell you today. Um, but I will start with a question. How many of you knows uh, what atomic design system is? Cool, cool. How many use uh, atomic design system in production? Okay, not so many. Um, cool, for the one that who doesn't know what atomic design system is, it's mainly it's like it's a, mon it's a mental model. It's a way for us to kind of help uh, reason about uh, our user interfaces. It was introduced by Brad Frost a couple of years ago. Um, there is a, a book and a, and a website around it. Um, mainly it evolved around a few principles. So it's like atoms, molecules, organisms, templates, and pages. And how you can uh, composite uh, all of those into more complex UI. For example, if you say that a button is an atom and a label is an atom, an atom, uh, a button with a label is a molecule, and so on. Um, but for the sake of this presentation, I'm going to uh, rephrase this a little bit and use something that's like, uh, it feels a little bit better with, with our stories, and so it's like it's not specifically atomic design as was conceived by Brett Frost. Um, what we're going to talk here is like design token, UI element, features, and systems. Um, they can closely map to the atomic design system concept by Brett Frost. I feel it's like it's a little bit simpler maybe to, to explain and use it. Let's start with design tokens. Uh, how, many of, how many of you have heard about design tokens? Cool. Uh, so Arthur mentioned uh, Nathan Curtis in his, uh, in his um, talk yesterday. Another account is it's one of the guys that's like it's really leading um, this uh, design system uh, movement. And one of the things that he suggests it's like it's these design tokens. You can think of like design token as a way to encapsulate every design decision. So for example, color, spacing, typography. Uh, the stuff that we are used to have in our CSS uh, or SAS variables, uh, those are like design decision. Um, you can think of for example, it's like a very, very simple example. It's like the, the, co the, the color brand. Um, you maybe give it a value. But then it's like you maybe want to use that uh, for the web, and you want this encoded in, into a CSS module file as a HTSL LA uh, value. Um, or maybe you're actually building for iOS, and you want that value into an RGBA, uh, into a JSON format. Or maybe, again, it's like you're building for uh, Android and you need an XML with an eight digit X format for the color. So it's like the idea of, the, of CSS token, it's like having a single source of truth uh, where designer like um, can put their decision and you can then build against all the target um, of the platform that you need. It's in a very, very agnostic way. There are quite few tools to, to support for that. One is like Istio from Salesforce. Uh, it's open source, you can check it out. Um, the idea is like the format that normally you want to use for those uh, design token. It's something that's low level and it's like kind of like agnostic. So you can use something like YAML uh, or JSON. Uh, JSON doesn't support comments, so maybe JSON 5 uh, if comments are something that you feel important in that direction. Then we have UI elements. And uh, gosh, uh, a lot of talks about that uh, today and yesterday. Amazing talks uh, from uh, Marie Lore. Uh, Sarah, Andrew, Flavio, Artem, uh, all of those people uh, talk and show us a uh, way to build a uh, UI component, way to work with them in style guides, um, way to encapsulate um, CSS into them and, and how to structure them. So I'm not going to deep dive into that that much because uh, we've been a lot, a lot, a lot of talk and expose of, of that. Then what, what you want to do with those, you want to use it to build features. So for example, it's like the header. Um, the other is like it's kind of like a little bit more complex. Uh, you can have data. You need to maybe fetch some data. Um, it maybe uh, expose more other piece of UI. So it can be slightly complex. And then um, you got system. So mainly where like you know use this feature for. For example, like a website or a web application and so on. But wait a minute. If we do a step back, I think it's like. Um, the talk was like not at a, about atomic design system. I mean, that was in the title, but the title was like deploying atomic design system. So it's like, if we think about it and we think about this feature about the header, 
the problem is like how we ship the header, how we put the header into production, and how we, we allow team to do that like independently. But one thing it's missing, I think, from the title, and actually was like the title, the full title was something like at scale. So how we deploy atomic design system at scale, and what, what scales mean? Um, it, it's kind of like a very, very vague word. Well, we thought it's like we make it, we can target web application, and we want to ship our feature to web application. We could also target other people application. Think of widget. Uh, I don't know, every, everybody probably have a like button on his page. Well, actually, there are Facebook engineering deploying to your website. Um, and so that's like really scale. Um, what about email? Have you ever thought about that? It's like in all the, the transaction email that you use, you probably use the buttons. How can you ship that style uh, in that email and work on the same? M maybe your email have like a footer and a header and so on, and it also rely on styles. All the email are HTML. I know a lot of table, so brace yourself. But um, you really want to have like also design system maybe to that. So let's give you a little bit uh, uh, context about my talk. Welcome to my talk, Deploying Atomic Design System at Scale. What it's going to be, it's going to be a story about refactoring, um, decentralized front-end architecture, and how we do things and we try to help uh, our team move fast. Um, hola, uh, Nick. Um, I'm a software engineer in OpenTable. I, I work in the developer experience team. So we produce uh, tools and infrastructure for our engineering team uh, to work. Uh, totally love open source software, uh, JavaScript, Node, whatever. And I am in the Open Components Core team. Oh yes, follow me on Twitter. I will share the slides uh, to this presentation afterward. So because I say that I'm going to tell a story, uh, I think it's like it's always good to give you a little bit of context and background because this is like it's our story. It worked for us. Uh, I, I, for, I don't mean that it have to work for you. So it's like don't take it as like you know you have to do as we are doing. Um, maybe you can borrow some idea and some concept. And totally, I would like to listen if you are doing that things in other ways from you afterward. Uh, come and talk to me. So, OpenTable was founded in '98. Uh, it's part of the Priceline Group, uh, so Booking, Kayak, we, it's like it's a group of big companies. Um, what we um, focus on as OpenTable, we focus on uh, finding a restaurant for people. Um, and we, we kind of like sit uh, a lot of people around the table every month. Um, this gives you, give you a little bit a, an idea of uh, a little bit the scale that we have. We have a 300 and plus uh, engineering uh, department that it scatters like across different uh, engineering uh, offices around the world. Uh, that means that we need to coordinate a lot. Uh, you maybe do a PR and it's like, you know, maybe there is someone that needs to review that PR in San Francisco and so on. So coordination, um, it's important. And also it's like, because if you take, how many people are here today? It's like 250, something like that. Take 200 people, 200 engineers for 20 years, the amount of code you produce is a lot. So uh, we have a lot of code. Um, we also handle millions of requests per minute on our front end. And so the code that we work and we need to build and ship need to be performant. And we have a full stack culture. And what I mean for full stack culture is like, doesn't mean that we don't have front end guys or front end people. It's like that we like to empower teams uh, to completely own uh, the features uh, that they develop. Uh, we like for them to be the one that uh, ship their feature as many time a day they want. Uh, we like for them to be on call uh, for the features and be responsible for when things goes wrong to fix those features. And so it's like this is what I mean for, for a full stack culture. Okay, so I think this gives you a little bit of context and I think I can start you, I can we can start this, this story of where we started from. Every story, every story starts with a once upon a time. And many story, I think uh, Braulio uh, mentioned that it uh, was a .NET developer. Um, we started with a .NET monolithic application. Um, one thing it's like, I found many times like the monolithic application being seen as a, as a negative thing. Uh, I think there are good parts uh, of, the, of a monolithic application. Probably what resonated in me is like the, the most 
the best part, it's product consistency. Very, very easy to achieve product consistency in, your pro in, in, in all your application. Um, and also, when you begin, it's like it's also easy to work on it. It's like, you know, you don't have many moving parts. Uh, all your logic is one place. It's very, 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 very easy and fast. That's why a lot of companies start with a monolithic application. But as you grow as a company, as uh, more people work on it, then uh, the velocity is low down. And one thing it's like, maybe it's, it's also good to, to look at it. It's like monolithic application can be sliced and um, refactored into many ways. And if you think about even going maybe microservice way where you have like, you know, an aggregation layer like GraphQL, like you, like Nick uh, showed us this morning, your front end application still be run in most cases as a monolithic application. Um, and so it's like this is always something that's like, you know, it's, it's good to keep in mind. And that's where we, we take our approach into slicing the monolithic. So it's like we, when we start from this, we say, OK, how can we slice that? Um, we, we went with a very vertical uh, slice. We call those microsite. So if you imagine that's like a, a, full, a full web application have many routes, many pages, we slice this into small sites that just handle one or two pages. So for example, like, you know, a start on page, maybe the restaurant profile, maybe a search page. Those are totally independent sites. Uh, and as microservices, uh, you can also build the stack as you want, a uh, very, very small team to own it, and allows us to refactor that uh, per route as we were going. So we didn't have to, to stop completely and rewrite the whole thing. It's interesting maybe to see how that work behind the scene. Um, so when you click something like opentable.com uh, slash San Francisco restaurants, what happened is you, you will hit our front door. So it's like kind of like a routing mechanism and load balancer. This will just see, okay, what you're actually looking here, it's like for the microsite start, that's how we call it, and you're looking for the metro uh, San Francisco. This is like in inside our uh, internal infrastructure. We'll send, the we'll, we'll find first uh, through discovery service a instance uh, of the start microsite that is available and it can take traffic. And then it can send uh, the, the request there. And the microsite have a very, very small API. So you can say just the domain, um, the metro for it's like San Francisco. And that's what you get. What you will get you back is just a page with the San Francisco restaurants. And so while it seems that you are navigating in the, in, in the, same, rest, in the same website, it seems a full, complete website, actually you're moving from website to website. Um, and this is good. It's like, for example, we went from B-weekly deploys uh, with a monolithic application to 300 deploy per week. So velocity increased a lot. Um, but as everything, when you introduce a new architecture, you solve some problem, and you know it's like a cover. To, you know you have cold, you take it out, and then your feet get out of the other way. So it's like there were some bad parts. And if you think about those being all uh, isolated website, they all share some common parts. So they're very very easy to think about our header footers um, and those kind of assets. So first. Um, it was like very, very bad for performance because like the user, as it was going from website to website, we were serving down the same assets uh, duplicated again. So that wasn't good uh, for per performance reason. The second is like working on this part was very, very hard. If you can imagine that's like, nowadays we have about 22 microsites just for the um, web application, for the consumer web. And if you think about doing a change in the header, that means you need to do 22 PRs on 22 microsites. Um, maybe the teams that own some of them are in different um, region of the world. So it's like you need to expect these to be deploying production in different time frame. So it's like this is like it takes a lot of effort. Um, and it's really, really suboptimal. So we thought, well, this is definitely a problem. Um, how, can we, how can we fix that? And so we thought, well, maybe we can build a microservices uh, for the shared part. It's like kind of like a microservice that serves those HTML fragments. And yeah, that's what we did. Um, and to see how it worked behind the scene as we worked before, as we saw before, so you have, um, you hit your opentable.com San Francisco. We get sent to the uh, microsite website. Microsite 
you know, does its own things. It will maybe uh, query a couple of database, uh, fetch some data. Um, and then before sending the, the HTML response back, it was like, oh, I need the header. Uh, so it's like, you know, it just do a get a request to the, to the microservices for the header. The header send, give him a, the, the microservices give him the header HTML or whatever asset he needs, add it to it, uh, and then send it back. Um, another thing is like that the microservice, in this way, the owners of the microsites didn't have to really care about how the header works, uh, what's the logic to get the data be, be, be behind the header. And so they can even say, well, you know, I want it's like the user type, it's admin, so maybe you have like a different uh, access uh, on menus on the header, and maybe I can even pass a, a, an accept, um, access language uh, for the header, and then say, well, I want it in Japanese. I, I just don't care, just give me the header in Japanese for the, for the header. And then it's like you just append it and send it back. And yeah, so this was like very good. We were super happy. It's like, wow, we, f we fixed these problems. But again, it's like, you know, we were pulling the cover from one side and then and some problem emerged from the other parts. Like, um, and the problem here was like that, what about uh, versioning? We didn't have any contract, a very, very clear contract between the microsite asking for the header and the header being changed. So what if your header breaks? some stuff, some microsites. Uh, for example, it's like all of those components have, can have different versions, right? minor, major, and we didn't have any way for, for handling that. Well, that was like kind of easy to fix. Uh, we, we added like a versioning endpoint that follows semantic versioning, very, very similar to um, how NPM works. So you, like the contract was very clear. You can say, oh, I want the header, I want that version. You can, you can even say, I want 1.x version, and it will give all the minors uh, for that. And that was like, okay. But there was, still, there was still another problem. And the other problem was like, adding more components to, the, to those microservices was art. So you need to do a PR on the, on the microservices. The microservices need to be redeployed. Um, and so it's like it wasn't suboptimal. We, we really wanted that, uh, we really wanted for, for our engineers to have like the, mass, the, the, the most effective speed and velocity possible. So we want them, oh, if you have to add a component, you should be able to publish to registry. Um, and so we thought of something like similar to serverless. Uh, it was also mentioned this morning, and we'll see a little bit what serverless means. I would say that's like very, very briefly short serverless. It's like, it's not no DevOps, it's like DevOps uh, done by someone else in a very nice way, so you don't have to think about it. Um, we call these open components, and these allow, it's like it's a structure that allow a uh, team to publish uh, their component without having to ask uh, the guys that uh, maintain the infrastructure, the registry, or whatsoever. They just can do that in, in real time whenever they want. Maybe it's, it's good to see how that works at kind of like an architecture level. So there are quite a few moving parts. Uh, first, we can start uh, on the top right, probably you, uh, and we have like the CLI. CLI is like very similar to the NPM CLI, allow you to kind of publish, retrieve components, and this is like what, what people use to initialize and start a component. We will first, after have a quick demo, so I can show you how that works. We have the, the registry. The registry is very, very similar to an NPM registry. It's just a REST endpoint API that allow you to publish, um, retrieve, and consume components. And then behind the scene, it's like we have components that are uh, put in a library. And if they have any part that need to be exposed, uh, they have like a public face in CDN. Um, components are nothing more that's like universal piece of code, like mainly uh, some JavaScript, some HTML. Um, and some CSS. We have what, what you see there, it's like it's templates. What, what template is, it's kind of like um, Valerie uh, yesterday gave us a brown bag, uh, uh, a lightning talk on um, how create React app is so awesome. And if you think about the React scripts uh, as a way to kind of like encapsulate all the um, configuration for our components are built, um, that's exactly our our te template API works. It's a way that encapsulates behind the scene all the configuration for people don't, that don't have to, b to bother around it. 
Um, and it all works across the stack. So it's like it works together with the CLI, with the registry, and with the client. Client library, those are not all. We also have like client library for Ruby, Rails, uh, Sinatra, and a few others. There are way to consume components. So it's like one, it's like very, very easy to think about. It's like the JavaScript client that you can have in your browser for doing client side, uh, maybe rendering. But if you want to do server side rendering or how the micro site consuming, for example, they're using the node library if, you're, if your site is built maybe with Express or Node. So how many of you I lost during the way? How many still follow me? Follow me? OK. Well, I lost you. So <laughs> the guys that I lost, it's like uh, all the questions at the end, was like just catch me, and I try to unlost you. Um, so quick recap to, to, to just tell you how do we arrive there. So like we, we follow a couple of steps. The first is like uh, we, we break our monolith application uh, by introducing this microsite architecture. Uh, we, that was like pretty helpful because we did that during a redesign phase and we were able to redesign root by root by just breaking it out. Um, also one thing that I didn't mention it's that we create a team, so it's like every microsite, it's like a team of two, four people. Um, and the idea is like to have very, very minimal dependency, um, very, very minimal complexity. So they can deploy the microsite totally independently. And that's the same throughout all the steps that we did. So sharing common parts, again, we wanted the, the guys that were uh, owning and building uh, the microsites not to have to to deal with uh, common parts. Like, you know, it was like just t time wasted for them. They, they need to focus on the logic that microsite, their microsite uh, is there to, 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 so, uh, to serve. And so we, we just take those away from them. And then again, we implemented a serverless architecture so that like everybody in the company can publish um, component to the, to the registry. Uh, that's, that's pretty interesting. I've seen like engineering joining the company and adding part of, of features in the front end in just one hour since they joined. That was like super amazing experience. And then we have this template API, so like that our infrastructure is totally UI framework agnostic. I um, don't know if I, I mentioned it, but like the templates, because they encapsulate how components are built, you can have like template for different stacks. So it's like you can have a template for, for React, you have a template to handle um, view, you can have a template to handle uh, handlebar jade, wh whatever kind of like front-end technology you want, uh, you can. If, if there is something that we don't support, you can just create your own. Or if you want to create uh, a, a different set of um, configuration, you can just create your own template. At the end, they are just uh, NPM modules. So I think it's maybe this will help the guys uh, that I lost. I give you a little demo and to see how, how it works. Um, When you do install the, the OC, uh, CLI, um, you get a lot of commands. So it's like you can just run it, and you will see all the commands that the CLI provide. Uh, what we are going to start with is the init command. That's very, very, very similar to the create React app. Um, and then as a, as a second parameter, you can pass uh, exactly how the create react app you can pass the script so in, uh, i don't know if many of you knows but in create react app you can pass as a second option your own react scri uh, react scripts if you want to maintain them without ejecting but have your own way of configuring it um, so we just call it uh, oc template react uh, you get your components out. Uh, yes, a lot of inspiration from the Create React app. If you see, it's like it's very, very familiar output uh, because it's so awesome. So it's like we, we took inspiration from it. Oh, yes, sorry. Better? Okay, sorry. And feel free to, to stop me if, if, you, if you see anything else. Um, and what you see, it's like it, it creates our, uh, our component. Uh, if we look what, we what is in there, we have few files. 
So let's just start by the manifest. It's a simple package JSON. Um, what we want to see in there is like the, the, OC, uh, the OC configuration. We have like a data provider, and this is like it's point to the server JS. It can be called as you like, and this is like it's our uh, serverless function. Uh, so we will see uh, in a few minutes how that works. This is optional, so it's like you don't have to have it in your components. And then you have like your view uh, where you say your entry point. It's our app JS in this case. Um, what kind of component is that? And then you can have few parameters. Those like our query params where you eat the endpoint for the component. Uh, they are used for creating documentation and for some server side validation of them. So here we have just a name uh, that is like it's a string and some default for it. If we look at the server JS, this is like just our serverless function. It's it's big enough. Yep. Better. More. Um, so it's, it's just an async function. Uh, you get some access to some context. I won't explain into the details, but in the context we can also have plugins. For example, we can have like a we have like an Apollo client uh, for GraphQL, so you can also have exposure to, to GraphQL, and you can you can enrich the context with with a plugin system. Um, and this is like it's related to how you set up the registry. Mainly, what you want to do here is like all your kind of like logic. This is private, so it's like it's also interesting. It's like this is not exposed anywhere. So it's like nobody have access to the server JS. So for example, I don't know, let's say that you, here you do add some stuff, you, you, you query some, uh, some, some database, uh, you fetch some data from some API, and you return some data at the end. So we can say, I don't know, uh, we did some stuff, and um, we get some greetings value back. Um, and then what we can do, we can pass that um, to our callback. And this is kind of, you can think of that as kind of like as the, the view model that you are passing it. This will be passed uh, to our, uh, to our uh, application, to our React application in this case. So we can move and, and look there. So this case is a very, very simple application. Um, what you see, we, we are getting this props name, uh, but we also added this greeting, so it's like maybe we can just get rid of that and say, uh, well, we want uh, yeah, what's greetings? Yep, um, and that's that's just your your React app, um, and we can what we can do now, we can um, we can run a development uh, registry to see how that how that works. So to run to run a dev a dev registry is just a matter of running OC dev and we want it to run it in that folder. And we have a little UI. Um, you you can disable that. That's like normally it's just for uh, for local development. And you see that we have this my first component in there. If we look in there few things. We see that we have the documentation for the parameters, um, and we have like the, the endpoint for uh, where our uh, component will be called. And then you can see a preview of, of our component. Uh, we say that's like it accept a name param, so we can say um, and then we have like our React application getting that. Um, maybe you can do a preview. So here you can see it full page, maybe it's a little bit bigger. Um, and again, you can pass query params to it. Yep, so this is like it's it's your, actually what happened, it's like the serverless function has been called, uh, the model has been passed to your, uh, to your React application. And this is like what you're seeing here, it's like, um, it's a, um, Client side rendering. So, it's like what we are doing every, uh, a, in this moment, we, in this preview, it's purely client side rendering. But then it's like, you know, I know that a lot of you, it's like, you know, really care about, oh, what about server side rendering? Um, well, the registry provides that for you um, automatically. So, for example, uh, we can do a curl 
if we do occur to the component endpoint. Uh, this is sim simple get to the component endpoint. We get back a server-side render version of the component. Um, and you can see that if we do the same and we pass name, something that we can see uh, very well. Yes, so you can see that this has been passed. Uh, it's in the React render, and we pass those as props after for ray duration. So you get server-side rendering automatically. Um, of course, uh, you can do that also by here. Like y you will see the same stuff. Um, cool. So now that we have our components, it's like how we ship this to production. Um, that's like that's the question. How we deploy this um, should be fairly straightforward. So we can stop the the dev registry. We we need to add a public registry where we want to publish. So uh, you have a command for that. Um, let's add a registry. And this is a registry that I create. Is the Roku still alive? Wake up. Now it's probably waking up. Whoa, live demo. Whoa. See? Okay, seems there. Yes, so cool. <laughs> <laughs> so we added our registry, and now we we can publish to it. Um, simple, like we just run OC publish, add the name uh, of our component. It was like my first component. It's a little bit slow. They can don't use the internet now, guys. Wow. Yep. Oh. Yes, and we got an error. And this is right. So it's like, you know, uh, because you say, oh, you know what? The version 1.0.0 of that component already exists on the registry. Components are immutable. You cannot uh, overwrite another component uh, because this will break uh, contracts for the consumers. So I think we can add just in the package JSON, we can make this, I think, 1.4 because I did few tests. Um, and then we can retry. It was published. Um, let's go and check. So this is was like this is the public registry. So it's like it's kind of production. And what we can see that we have a version 1.4.0 for for my first component. Um, what you can see, you can also check all the version. And if you check one of them, you will have the the, uh, the serverless function and the component and all the assets related to that version. So it's like it's really immutable. Um, and yeah, again, it's like this is work. As, as as we intended, uh, but okay. So now we have like our component in the registry, but it's like well, it's like it's half of the story. We want to use this somewhere, right? We want to use it in our application. So I shamelessly cracked the a a Alicante website, um, and let's say that I have a version there, and we want to do a PR and publish that. So it's like what I do. I can show you the PR. It's very simple. So it's like two line of code. The first one, you add the uh, custom tag, OC component, uh, the href for the registry, and you can see I'm pinpointing to version 1.4.x, and, and then we also need the client side. So this is like it will be just client side rendering. And what we can do, we can merge this live. Wow, that's the scariest demo I ever done. Um, and then we can try to deploy this on now 
on now. Um, who use now here? Oh, phew. So now I have something very nice that it's like if you just gave it uh, your user, GitHub username and your um, repo, uh, it will deploy that. So you can try that. It will search it. Yes. So this is like it will deploy a Alicante website uh, that can consume our component uh, on Node.js. And so that we can, we can try to see if that works. Whoop. Okay, yes. And here should be. We can see if that works. This is like the moment of truth. Whoop. Yeah, internet is a little bit low. So maybe what we can do, we can go back Oh, it's like, it's, it's loading. Uh, yeah, so maybe you know this website. Uh, the background is loading. It's taking a little bit. Uh, we, what we did, we just say, oh, we wanted an open component, the one that we just published on the registry to be used on this page. And look at here. It's not very nice, but we have it. Uh, and that means that now we have established the contract. So if my team owned that component, I can keep deploy to the to the registry and will automatically be at runtime in the our website in production. Um, yeah. So. So we saw our client side rendering work. We did a PR to use that. Um, what about server side rendering? What if you want to do server side rendering? Um, we have, for example, this is like it's an example of a Node client. Um, you can just require it. You can instantiate it uh, by setting up where the registries are. Um, you can also give some components uh, that you want to warm up. This will be, they will be cached uh, by the time the client initialized. Um, and then you can just call render component, uh, the name of the component. You can al al always pass an uh, option, and then um, you get back the HTML. We also have a batch endpoint for post, co uh, for post uh, request, and you can have uh, multiple components uh, in a single request. So we said about at the beginning about email, and we say it's like, oh, you know, Bob, why not targeting email? Well, that's actually what we are, what we're doing every day. Um, what we do, it's like if you think about email uh, components, we have like we just ship uh, components to to the registry, and then we have a system that when the transactional email goes out it renders them into emails. And this is like it's super nice because we can have teams that work on specific part of the email and deploy that part of the email totally independently. They don't have any dependence on any team and they say, oh, you know what, the header maybe should be different. And what they can do, they can run a lot of A-B tests in how the, the email uh, perform better with different variants. Of course, the other, the other nice example, it's like external widgets. Like uh, one way is to go, it's like normally using iframes or something like that if you want to embed it. This, this we already, s we just saw it uh, now live in the React, uh, Alicante React website uh, example. You can embed something in there and keep deploying uh, the latest version to this website. Um, it's something that you don't have too much control over to this website and you don't want to ask people, hey, can you update your website because we, we have a new version of the widget. To give you a little um, figure for the scales, at the moment, it's like numbers are growing, but like at the moment, our registry it's uh, delivering up around 100 million uh, components per day. Um, then we have some tools, um, and tools like uh, are are interesting. What we have one, it's like it's for example, it's like it's a Chrome extension. It allows to see all the open components that are live in a production website, and what you can see, you can choose. Um, the version, for example, oh, you know what, I want this on a different version. And you can change the props that you can pass to it um, 
and that component, only that component, will re-render with those new parameters. For example, we are changing the review and now to be rendered in Japanese, um, and now you have it. And the, the very, very nice things that I like about this tool that you can say, you know what, for this component, I want this to be served by my local dev registry. So what you end up having is like you have your uh, dev registry serving a, a component inside a production website and you can test how it is, how it works there uh, before shipping it. So who's using Open Component today? Um, of course, us. Uh, there's Skyscanner is using in production, check. Uh, so it's like, uh, there are quite a few other company uh, that are starting to adopt it, and it allows their teams to be kind of like very, very fast in, in keeping iterating on the features because you don't have dependency uh, for that part of the front end. So everything that you saw today, it's open source. Uh, and you can, you can just run it and install it. It's like it's, sim it's pretty much a, a, node, Java, a node application. Um, and then uh, you can write your component as you like. We support at the moment Jade, Underbar, and React. Uh, but you can just add your own format uh, without much problem. Um, of course, I got stickers, as everybody does. So if you want to come here. Um, and yeah, and muchas gracias. Uh, first of all, congrats, because I think it's a really cool approach for front-end and widgets, and it seems to be nicely done. And my question about it, uh, do you handle somehow vendor duplication? So let's say you compose a page by several open components, which build React, so React is on those bundles and you have it multiple times, how do you do that? Yeah, so it's you know, very similar to how Create React app work when you have your React scripts, they handle all the configuration. So it's like if you have like code splitting, vendors, uh, management in there, it's done. So that's, it's been done by our own scripts, the one that you see in the template API system. So what we do is like we, we handle like vendors, we handle code splitting, we handle like the CSS modules and all those stuff. Then it's like because this system work uh, all together with all the moving part of the of the infrastructure. For example, the client side JavaScript library get automatic dynamically uh, set up to work with specific components. So it's like let's say you get to a page. Uh, I'm talking about uh, client side rendering. Let's say that you go to a page, um, and then you say, "Oh, there is this component, and this component it's uh, it's a component." done with React, it knows that it, know, it, it need to fetch from maybe from the CDN a couple of library, and then it can try attempt to render it. Um, and so this is cache. Also, because components are immutable, you can cache that infinitely. That means that's like, imagine that you're publishing a new version of your components, and you just change the, uh, the serverless um, file function. Uh, that means that's like your new version, it will still be the same version for the client. So it's like this will be already cached, you can just call and get the data differently. W one thing that I didn't show you um, is that you can also do, let's see if it works. Mm. You can also call the component and here I'm simulating in the headers I add, it's like an, an accept header where I can say, I want a unrendered uh, call to that endpoint. If you call that, what you get, you get pure data. So it's like uh, at this moment in time, you can see the props being passed. You also have a static path that get automatically passed for the uh, CDN. So it's like if you are adding assets, they get automatically added to an, S buck, an S3 buckets. Um, in this case, every time you're caching the client, both if you're doing that on the server side or on the client, you just then get pure data. And you can change your data on the, on the, on the Lambda function, but like the, the I cached asset stay there. Okay, okay first of all, uh, congratulations also for the great solution. Mm. Here. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and I have a couple of questions. Uh, first of all, um, as uh, as I have seen, you have to depend on an external CDN to serve that component um, dynamically. And uh, I wanted to ask if is there any way to 
uh, install that dependency on your project in the NPM style to uh, be your own responsibility to uh, guarantee the, the availability of that service? Yeah, so uh, at the moment, like we have an R dependency uh, only on the uh, S3 buckets. Um, we are working toward making this like a little bit more plug and, and playable so that you can provide your own uh, CDN if you like. Um, we have a couple of uh, people working in that direction. There are a couple of PR up. Um, so that's, that's probably something that is coming. Uh, I, I'm not sure I would use NPM for that. It's like, it feels like NPM is very, very good for maybe build time. Not sure it's like it's the right register for, for runtime, but yeah, sure, you, sh you should be able to mm -hmm. maybe hook it in there. Uh, okay, thanks. And the second question is uh, about component communication. Yeah. Because uh, as you can see, to input properties into the, into the component, you can use the U URL with parameters and these kind of things. But the component can uh, output events or communicate with other components, and how do you manage that? Yeah, so normally we run some event buses and they communicate through events uh, between them. Um, there are we are experimenting with few uh, with few approaches and we have few ideas in there. Um, one is like you could have like a component that maybe provides like a Redux store and all the components can subscribe to that r uh, Redux store when they uh, get mounted. Um, this could be one way. Uh, there are many ways. Like so, the 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 system, the architecture, infrastructure doesn't enforce any of you, uh, or any of these to you. It's about you to provide it. Thank you. Thank you. More questions? So now we're going to do the raffle. Just wait for uh, a couple of minutes because we, yeah, for her. <laughs> 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 <laughs>